welcome everybody. I'm happy that there are so many people uh, wanting to fix our broken food system. <laughs> I'm uh, Marieke van Schoonhoven, editorial manager of Food Unfolded. Uh, and I'm actually uh, replacing Saskia, the uh, Saskia, <laughs> Sophia. <laughs> Saskia is there. Sophia, uh, <laughs> the founder of Food Unfolded. She uh, uh, woke up sick yesterday, so uh, I'm replacing her. And I'm going to kind of improvise, but uh, I know uh, what I'm talking about as well, because uh, yeah, I'm managing <laughs> the thing. Uh, so um, uh, maybe to start a little bit about Food Unfolded, what we do. Uh, Food Unfolded is a multimedia platform. Uh, bringing science-based insights and journalistic stories about uh, our food system, uh, food system, biggest food system challenges, the origins of our food, and the newest uh, agriculture and food innovations. Uh, we do this via articles, podcasts, videos, our website, uh, our well-visited Instagram channel, uh, and events like this one. Um, um, what else? We do this in English and Spanish and German so far. And we have actually uh, perhaps plans to, to also expand uh, to the Dutch language, so uh, uh, we keep you posted. <laughs> uh, and uh, Food Unfolded is funded by EIT Food, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology on Foods, uh, under the Horizon Europe program. So they are our uh, biggest uh, funders. Um, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I hope with uh, informing you with this event, you will uh, be inspired and uh, get something, some key messages at home uh, that you will then share with your friends and family and in that be part of the, the, the story to transform our food system. Um, maybe first let me walk you through what's going to happen, ha gonna happen today. So uh, we will first see the premiere of What We Eat, our um, documentary series. It's a co-production between Food Unfolded and Will Media, an Italian media platform. Um, and um, the first episode is, uh, is, is, is this one. It's a six-series uh, documentary series. And um, 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 after showing the documentary, I will invite Sylvia Lazares, the, the documentary maker and a Food Unfolded editor and Will uh, journalist uh, to the stage as well as Dan Saladino, uh, prominent BBC uh, food journalist and writer of the bo book Eating to Extinction. And um, yeah, the, the idea is then that I asked uh, ask them to the stage and that from the beginning we will open a conversation so that you will also be part of the conversation from the beginning and that we will have an interactive series about uh, our food system. Um, and about the documentary and about biodiversity in food, uh, all in uh, very uh, important topics. Um, uh, after uh, this conversation, we move to the foyer at five. I think then by then talking so much about food, you will be thirsty and hungry. So then we will talk a bit more and network over food and drinks. Um, and um, then you will have the opportunity to buy our Food and Folded paper magazine. Um, and we plan to also have <laughs> a signed copy for you uh, of Eating to Extinction, the book of Dan Saladino, but uh, we just found out that the books are not here, but in Belgium. So <laughs> we have to improvise this as well. So uh, we will make sure that you get your signature, you can buy the book and then we will ship it to you. You'll, you can leave your address and uh, we will fix this as well. Um, and um, yeah, then at six we, uh, we finish and uh, we say bye and uh, we hope uh, you learned a lot. Um, so um, maybe a question for you now, who is buying their foods in a supermarket? That's, I would say, I think 80% or more. I think uh, that is indeed all, <laughs> almost exactly the number of uh, or the percentage that people buy uh, food in supermarkets around 80 percent and in this first episode that you will now see you will see why this is actually quite surprising um, but maybe uh, yeah not to go to in too much detail into what you will see just see it and afterwards we can uh, ask questions and discuss further uh, so uh, please enjoy A lot to take in, I just said. <laughs> it's a 20-minute uh, uh, um, 
yeah, setting the scene. So uh, I think we've seen the hundred years until now, and uh, how we and how the supermarket pl played a big role in uh, how we got to our current system, current food system, and also why this current food system is not working for the future. And the other five episodes will go more into detail about the different challenges that we uh, are now facing and what could be the possible um, uh, solutions for this. So. I will introduce now our two stars of the day. Uh, Sylvia Lazares, it's, uh, the, she's a documentary maker, or yeah, she also has a director and a producer, but she is definitely a big part of the documentary series. Um, so a little bio about you, Sylvia. Sylvia Lazares is an Italian freelance science journalist. After graduating from a master's in science communication at Imperial College London in 2017, her work has been published in national and international media outlets, including BBC World Service, Wired UK and Corriere della Sera. She tackles ethics, power and science, often through the lens of food, and she's currently an editor for Food Unfolded, like I said, and an author at Will Media, the leading new media company in Italy. And then our second guest is Dan Saladino, uh, a prominent uh, food journalist and presenter of BBC's Radio 4's The Food Programme. His first book, Eating to Extinction, the world's most endangered foods and why we need to save them, is an epic journey into the history, culture and future of food and... <laughs> <laughs> involved 15 years of travel and story collecting. Since publication by Jonathan Cape in the UK and FSG in the United States, Eating to Extinction has won multiple awards, including winner of the prestigious Wainwright Prize for Conservation and Nature, recipient of the Jane Grigson Trust Prize for a debut, uh, debut food book special commendation by the Andrews Simmons Awards, awarded the Fortnum and Mason Book of the Year, winner of the Guild of Food Writers Food Book Award, and also the Guild's first book award and winner of the Corriere de la Sera's book of the year. Yeah. Eating to Extinction was also shortlisted in the Stanford Travel Writing Awards and then the book has also been sub the subject of articles in loads of international media like the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Economist, Financial Times and so on. Uh, a big welcome to you two. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What is Hi. most convenient for you? Hello. Yeah, I'll sit here. Nice. Wow. You managed in 20 minutes. You managed to fit in uh, <laughs> so many <laughs> more, more I than I packed into 400 fast. pages. No, oh, it's yeah. It um, a that's also a note yeah. that I wanted to make. Sorry, that we are open to feedback. So I think it was a, a great, a great uh, first episode. But we're still in the process of producing and editing the other five. So all the feedback is welcome here or afterwards in the in the network session. Um, yeah. And we're going to try and have a uh, relaxed, spontaneous conversation yeah. in which we have tr I'm going to try and weave in some images so you can see pictures of foods. And uh, But because it is a spontaneous conversation, if we start <laughs> talking about bananas but you see a, an orange, then please bear with us. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Um, I will um, prompt the first question and I will leave the stage to you. Yeah. And I will be in the, in the room to ask questions if you want to. To ask a question in Dutch, uh, then it's also fine. I will translate. Um, so my 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 first question, and then I leave it to you. <laughs> uh, for you, Sylvia, is seeing this documentary and uh, uh, seeing all the work you put in there and all the research. What is the most surprising thing that you discovered doing this research for the documentary series? Yeah. So I don't know many many interesting surprising things, but I would say I don't know. There, there's two things. Can I say two things that, mm -hmm. that were most surprising? I mean, the first one is how, actually, how recent our supermarket system is. I don't know. I was born in the 90s, and I just assumed that had always kind of been there. And then when I started to delve into that, um, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> realizing that, um, that the food system was, you know, basically as old as my parents was, was strange. Uh, but also, I think, another interesting thing was to realize that that was actually the, the supermarket arrived to Europe almost as a as a soft power exercise from the United States I mean this expo in Rome where the supermarket was displayed and and people were running up and down the aisles and uh, apparently I mean we didn't put it in the documentary because there's no fact-checking on that but the Pope 
gave his blessing from the Vatican or, or something <laughs> like that. that. That's just, uh, that was very surprising to me. Um, <laughs> because we, we take it for granted, um, but it was really not. Is the Pope doing his grocery shopping in the supermarket as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, there were there were some cardinals at that expo, <laughs> like walking down the aisles of the supermarket. Okay, no, but it's actually then maybe also quite uh, promising that such a big shift is done so fast, so that we maybe also can change our behaviors also as fast or maybe faster to go to a new food system or a new standard. Yeah, so that was cause, yeah because it's always talking about yeah, but people's behavior change is is not going to happen. It's it's so difficult. But actually, if you see how quickly things changed, then it's actually yeah, yeah. a promising thing. Yeah, I think we feel very much locked into this system, but we really are not. We, we, are, we keep running it, so we can also decide to change it, hopefully well, together. What we did brilliantly in the film as well is it's there's, 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 there's almost the, the sequence of events that just leads in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess what, what we lose in, as a consequence is the complexity and the, the diversity, but you can understand how one yeah. um, breakthrough or technological development leads to another. Yeah. And without asking the right questions, you just end up down this linear track. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, I mean, in the, in the documentary, we didn't touch on many other things that happened, of course, over the same century. So we, we talked a lot about the supermarkets, but there were many other technological and uh, cultural innovation uh, and political events uh, that happened over that time span. And... Um, Dan, in your book, you write a lot about the Green Revolu Revolution. Sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you, you write a lot about the Green Revolution, and maybe we want to introduce that too, because without that, of course, a big I piece is I think that's, the, that's the, almost the hidden story taking place behind the scenes. Yes. It's, it's the inputs, really, that make the yeah. supermarket model possible, yeah. uh, which I think is a, a, it's a really important um, story to understand. And I think if, if there's anything that films can do or books can do or conversations we need to know the story yeah uh, and i think the green revolution is one of them and you know it's a, it's a complex thing and there's still a, a a live debate really about the merits and and the problems challenges created by it but at least the more of us who are engaged and understand uh, yeah, we, we can question and then figure out where do we go next. Yeah, do we want to say what the Green Revolution is? Just in well, case? We get, we, we, let, let's get to that in a moment because I think we need okay. to build up to that. Yeah, uh, let's do that then. In a moment. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, then yeah, I'll, follow, I'll follow the outline. Then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I read um, Dan's book and I was also um, struck by a lot of the data that I found and uh, a lot of the things that I, that I saw in that book. For example, I have maybe like two or three terms for wheat, um, like like species of wheat mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm aware of. But then reading Dan's book, I realized there's like half a million mm -hmm. species of mm -hmm. wheat. Uh, and that, that was crazy for me because we don't actually have a lot of terms to describe the, the biodiversity of food that we have around us because we're always surrounded by the same, you know, few species. Now, like four species, four four species, and and four crops are feeding most mm. of the world, most of the calories in the world. And so, it's almost as if we don't even know what we're losing yeah. because we don't know what's out there. So maybe you want to. Yeah, it's almost as if we as we've lost our our connection with the land and with, I guess, what I think is an important word as well, agrobiodiversity. So, agricultural, biological diversity or food diversity. We've lost. Uh, many of the nuances or the complexities of our, of our palates as well. And yeah, al along with that, uh, a vocabulary as well. And I think crop diversity is one of those things. If we could um, just switch over to the, um, to the PowerPoint, so I have some images to, to uh, illustrate what we're talking about. Because um, I, I had, in, in, the, in the size of the book, um, I had the benefit of um, going back millions of years in a sense, in, in our food history. So two million years of, of bipedal humans, and then um, our most successful lifestyle to date, hunter-gatherers. And then um, 12,000 years ago, those hunter-gatherers in the Fertile Crescent particularly became the first farmers because they were interacting with these wild grasses. And uh, through selection, unconscious and conscious, um, they, they eventually develop the early wheats as part of the Neolithic package. The Neolithic package are the earliest domesticated foods. So it includes wheat, barley, chickpeas, lentils, 
a um, few other more marginal things. They also that's also the process of domestication in which we get cattle, uh, goats um, as well. And as those populations of farmers then spread out around the world, so do the seeds and the crops. That results in adaptation. So as wheat spreads out from the Fertile Crescent, it arrives in different environments. There are different cultural preferences over time. And so a huge amount of diversity is created. And I think one of the questions I had in writing the book was, well, how much diversity is out there? Um, and one evidence of that is the... Um, and there we go, there, Svalbard, which is the, 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 um, the backup for all of the seed banks around the world. And when you look at the accessions of crops, so what they've done is they've taken wheat from as many different places as, the, as possible, and then they put them into the seed vault. And so you end up with 213,000, that should be, um, in unique accessions of wheat, whereas a farmer in Europe will be given a recommended list of around 10 pretty genetically uniform crops. And so we get to the point where, as you've mentioned, huge amounts of biodiversity in our food system is being lost. So although we have thousands of edible plants, we end up with nine major um, crops feeding the world, of which three, uh, wheat, rice and maize, provide the world with more than half of its calories. But it's that hidden story of yep. the diversity within those crops is what we've lost. Because wheat is one of the most genetically plastic, if you like, flexible crops um, in terms of the nutrients it can have, where it can grow, the appearance, the colour, the flavours as well. I mean, that's one thing. we've The, the association yep. of wheat with, with flavour uh, in many cultures is a powerful thing. But for most of us, it's, it's been lost because wheat has become a commodity. Right. So, and apart from taste, actually, do we have, um, what else are we losing with biodiversity? So some people could say, why, why, why should we care about this? Well, um, the reason why we should care is also reflected in this. So I think um, in that period that you've described in the, um, the rise of the supermarket, behind the scenes, we also saw huge amounts of consolidation in um, the, the food industry. So the supermarket could only exist because the inputs into that system became cheap commodities. And so you see the development of uh, consolidation of power in the seed industry, for example. Um, as you can see, 50% of the world's cheeses depend on starter cultures and enzymes from one company based on the outskirts of Copenhagen near the airport, you know, it's an amazingly specialised industry, but again, huge amounts of consolidation of, of power. And then, um, yeah, the genetics of the livestock around the world has been shrunk. So, for example, in the poultry industry, mm -hmm. there are three main genetic yeah. lines yeah. owned by two major corporations. Yeah. So that we've lost that kind of diversity as well. But replacing that um, is monocultures. So most famously with the banana, we have 1,500 different um, varieties of or types of bananas globally. We've ended up with the Cavendish, which is the globally traded banana. Um, again, we've lost huge amounts of flavour and uh, different farming systems that underpin these uh, different types of bananas that, that are sometimes dessert bananas or cooking bananas, uh, sometimes used for brewing as well. And so, um, yeah, in the, in the disappearance of that, we've ended up with uh, a risky food system as well, because as many of you might know, the Cavendish, because it's so genetically uniform, it's not um, grown from seeds, it's clonally propagated. So you take the suckers from underground, you plant them and you end up with a clone. And so therefore, if a disease hits one, it can hit them all. And so we're seeing in the different... Uh, producing regions of the world, which are growing this one globally traded banana. Farmers being devastated by this disease as their businesses um, are lost, and a big question over the future of a fruit that is in most of our um, kitchens. But as yeah. you brilliantly... Which is also recent. Well, yeah, it's yeah. also a recent thing. But again, you know, the idea that you can create a system, yeah. a monocultural system, which means that these fruits are grown in tropical parts of the world, but arrive in supermarkets, it's one of the cheapest food you can buy is an illustration of, again, how, how 
um, how that system delivered yeah, to what many people was, was a serious breakthrough of affordability and abundance. And just finally, what we are also losing is the barriers between us as a species, our food production systems, and biodiversity and, and the wilderness. And, you know, of COVID, we're still, we still suspect that that was because of these barriers being broken between the wild and the, you know, the urban and the domesticated. But COVID was a, a, a relatively uh, mild form of virus in terms of the, um, the death rate. There, are, there was an outbreak of uh, another type of virus in Malaysia at the turn of the century when its, its pork industry, so its pig production, spread into an area where there were, there, uh, there was forest, there were fruit bats, feed became contaminated, and a really deadly virus took hold there and wiped out the industry and killed you know, over 100 people in a short space of time, and it was confined. But these are big risks we face by that loss of biodiversity and the arrival of this uniformity and homogenization of the food system. And do you think this homogenization is the result of, of uh, the commodification of food? So we, we, it went from being you know, very local, a subsistence mm. uh, sort of... Um, Yeah, yeah, food <laughs> to becoming almost a commodity, we, which is the same everywhere. We have over specialization of countries or companies. Yeah. Do, do you think these two things are linked? M most definitely. And I think obviously you need to go further back in terms of industrialization. Uh, you mentioned Henry Ford as well, and that model being created in Britain, for example. We, we had. Uh, the most rapid and early form of industrialization, so many people became disconnected with the land. To feed the urban poor, you then depend on bringing food into the cities in increasing amounts. And then there was, you know, we had an empire as well, so you could bring in huge volumes of food from around the world. And that's the model that arrives and spreads around the world. And so it's that disconnect, I think, that has unfolded that, that you know, has, has It changed our relationship with food completely, but also nature uh, and the planet. Um, I just want to mention this. This is a, a non-food person, a physicist, uh, based in Boston, um, but says some brilliant things about the, our use of science, because to, uh, to arrive at that commodification of food requires those breakthroughs. So crop, early crop science emerges at the end of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century, the um, Haber-Bosch process, yeah. so the arrival of fertilizers at the beginning of the 20th century, and then the Green Revolution, which we'll get on to in a moment, produces a, you know, genetically uniform crops that provide huge amounts of calories. These are all amazing scientific breakthroughs in their own right, but we were just so focused on production, we didn't question the impact of the, of the complex systems they were overriding yeah. and what was being lost as a consequence. Yeah. So actually, yeah, I saw that there's a question. Yeah. Hello. <coughs> Testing. No, not with me. Hello. No, I see not. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, I just had a question about, because earlier you had on the screen that there is, you know, 215,000 species of wheat. So how did we get to, you know, 10 species that are on a list for farmers. Like, how did we, who chose to go, who chose those specific species, right? Like, how do we go from a number like that yeah. to just a, a simple list of 10? Yeah. Can I just change photos to answer that question? Because I think that's a really, <laughs> that is a really important and big question. Um, so, Russian botanist Nik Nikolai Vavilov in the 90s, so 100 years ago, traveled across five continents collecting seeds and creates the first seed, seed bank in Russia, in um, St. Petersburg. And he had grown up in an era in which there was famine in Russia. Um, there had been the Irish potato famine a few decades before. That was a consequence of, one of the reasons for that was that they were planting the same genetically identical potato in, in the, the, called the lumper potato, in the so same soil. And again, um, f a fungal disease over, overwhelms the crop. A million people die, many more millions leave Ireland. The population has never fully recovered. Nikolai Vavilov believed that diversity was the crucial thing that stood in the way of us and hunger and disaster in, in the future. But it, Norman Borlaug, who is one of the chief architects of the Green Revolution, um, was working in Mexico 
in the 1940s, wanted to improve the livelihoods of Mexican farmers, and wanted to do that by, by improving wheat and making it able to take up the newly available synthetic fertilizers without falling over and also to have disease resistance. So he takes a type of wheat or types of wheat from the, uh, Mexico and the States and combines it with a type of um, wheat found in Japan, a new, very unusual because it was so short. It was a dwarf wheat. And then he breeds them together and then creates um, this really high yielding but very short wheat. So if you drive past or walk through a wheat field, and this is why they just come above your knee, really, because they are d dwarfed varieties of wheat. But it means they can put more of their energy into, the, into producing the grain. And it's so successful at producing lots of grain and lots of calories, it quickly spreads around the world. And so all of that diversity that I mentioned in Svalbard quickly disappears because everyone wants to be growing that type of wheat, thinking that all we really need are calories and energy. So that system really is the one that takes off, that gives us um, you know, the, 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 the kind of lack of genetic diversity. What also happens around the same time is because of the chemical inputs demanded by these new crops, which is um, you know, the pesticides, fertilizer, the companies that are producing those uh, start to invest in seed companies as well. Mm. So all of the major companies that own seeds today begin as chemical companies providing the inputs into this green revolution after the Second World War to produce more and more food. And so you see a, a shrinking in the genetics of the global food system and also in the, in the major business players who are um, providing the inputs. But there are people who quite quickly realised this was a problem. So this is a guy called Jack Harlan, whose father, Harry Harlan, uh, an amazing uh, botanist, knew Vavilov in the 1920s. And it became Jack Harlan's obsession that the diversity that Vavilov was talking about in the 1920s and 30s was essential for, again, saving. I mean, this, this um, quote is really important, that these resources, by that seed diversity, crop diversity, stand between us and catastrophic starvation on a scale we cannot imagine. Because he could see that if you have this uniformity, if a crop fails, it all fails. And that's a dangerous situation to be in. That quote was picked up by uh, Carrie Fowler, an American botanist in the 1990s, who luckily for us convinces the Norwegian government to dig a tunnel down into the Arctic Circle to build the um, Svalbard seed vault, which is where 10,000 years of agriculture now sits in the form of seeds. So that's the inheritance my inheritance from my ancestors who farmed for thousand year, thousands of years. The inheritance of all of your ancestors who farmed for thousands of years can be found deep under the ice, but missing from most of the world's fields. So that's kind of how we got there, because it's that reductionist sense in the, after the Second World War of we need food, we need calories, we have starving populations. Here is a scientific breakthrough. Uh, fossil fuels aren't a really a, a, an issue at that point. We don't, you know, climate change isn't a, a major issue in the 50s and 60s and 70s, although there were obviously yeah. some pioneering thinkers who, yeah. who did think it was. <laughs> it was already, but for, yeah. in terms of mainstream politic, yeah. political thinking, it, it wasn't. The agenda. Yeah, and yeah. so we plough on with this idea that we don't need diversity. We've cracked it. We've solved the food problem. And that's how we ended up where we are today. Yeah. Do, do you have any other questions? Yeah, there's a question actually over there. Hi, thank you so much. My question is about this uh, seed bank. And uh, well, from the point of view of protection, I could understand um, why it is uh, the way it is and design the way it is and where well, where it is, um, I, I also don't understand, but um, my it's just off the no it's within the Arctic Circle, off the nor north uh, of the Norwegian coastline. So it, it's, it was thought to be the safest place away from you know potential conflict, wars, 
climatic change, other th- the, the risk, they say, the biggest risk were polar bears. That's why it's, it is where it is. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the answer. I still don't understand why that place was chosen. Um, and because I do wonder about the democracy of it. Um, I mean, we're talking about monopolizing uh, the food system and uh, you know having people that are controlling certain things. And it feels mm. to me, yes, I do understand the protection of seeds, mm-hmm. but um, we are uh, also responsible for what we eat and um, yeah, how we take care of it. So I'm just this wondering. Is, yeah, this is a backup. So there are hundreds and hundreds of seed banks around the world in, in most countries, and most countries are preserving their own resources. This is the, so there's, this holds the duplicate. So for example, there was a seed bank in Syria, and then the war hits, and they, they are at risk of losing huge amounts of valuable crop diversity. Luckily, they were, they were backed up here. So this isn't doesn't have exclusive control over anything. And in fact, this is, pub- this is open access. So if you wanted to become a crop breeder and then start to use some of the genetics from a, you know, an ancient type of wheat, you, you, you basically, this is accessible to you. So there isn't really control. The big control is over the seeds that are now on the market because they are in so, so few hands. And because they are mostly F1 hybrids, where they will not breed true and you cannot save them and replant them. So this is a public resource. Okay. I just also wonder then from the glo- uh, Global South perspective, you know, um, how, how is that also then um, accessible, say, to somebody in South Africa, for example? It's not super easy to uh, get there or, I, I, you know, I just think that they maybe... They usually set, I mean, seeds you can send in the post. So that's not a problem. But there is a movement of seeds around the world between these different institutions and universities and researchers and crop breeding stations, including many in Africa as well. There are people in the Andes, for example, who are concerned about the loss of types of maize and to protect it for future generations. They send it to Svalbard just for safekeeping. So it's not a, it's not a, a mission to control, but to protect and save and preserve for future use. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's almost like a backup server more than a museum, yes, right? Exactly. It's not like yeah. we're, we're taking things from Greece and putting it in a museum yeah. in uh, yeah. London, sorry. But this isn't the solution. <laughs> this isn't, I mean, yeah, we need yeah. diversity out there. We need people to be growing these crops in, in Africa. Uh, this is merely to, this is the safety net because now they are in the ch- being chilled below the ice. They're, vi- they're viable. But we need them to be in the soil so they can carry on that story of from the Fertile Crescent or from China with rice or from Mexico with maize. We need them to be evolving and adapting to changing conditions. And maybe we can also get into the Green Revolution, talk about how actually a few companies got to manage the majority of of the seeds around the world. Mm. Oh, there's more questions. Sorry. Yeah, let's go ahead. The seeds that are preserved in vaults like these went out of fashion, if that's the Mm -hmm. right word, because uh, they couldn't compete with the ones that were doing better. So land races of wheat that were more productive prospered. So how do you feel about modifying these seeds that are dormant? Um, What is your opinion on genetic modification? Do you think we could get more out of these seeds if we use technology to improve uh, certain aspects of them? Hmm. Um, Yeah, I'd I'd qualify that idea that they went out of fashion because they were less productive. Because there are are many reasons why we lose crop diversity. So for example, um, in India, Uh, the Green Revolution arrives, and it makes a huge impact. But before that, that there had been um, uh, the British colonization, which meant that they, they took wheat from Britain, and then they created you know, huge areas of wheat production, and the Green Revolution expanded rice cultivation as well. And we end up with a situation today where you know, it's the, the record-breaking temperatures this summer, in India. We have high levels of nutrient deficiency, even in people with access to lots of food in India, because the, the, you know, the, the kind of diet, you touched on pellagra, for example, yeah. but again, there is, because, it, because of the emphasis on rice and wheat, 
because the food system had been distorted, um, there is a public health consequence. What did exist in, in India, alongside rice and alongside wheat, were millets. So these tiny, tiny grains, like um, sorghum and phonio, and, but India had some of the, the, the most diversity of, of millets. And they're wonderful because they can grow um, in areas where there's not much water, and they actually can supply many of the nutrients that are missing, particularly in the female population in India. The Indian government uh, l has lobbied the United Nations for 2023 to become the year of millets, to try and raise awareness in populations and also to encourage more research. And so there's a big push now to bring back millets. Now, they might, some of them might not be as high yielding as fields of wheat, but actually, we're in a far more complex situ situation now where it's not just about the production of calories, which is causing hu huge problems around the world. Um, and not only that, there is new technology which meant, meant that millets were a, a kind of crop that women in villages would have to spend hours and hours grinding away to produce the flowers and other forms that, that they would use. You know, there's now... You know, machines Technology. that can, can yeah. do that as well. So that's just an example of we don't just lose diversity because one crop produces more than another. There are lots of historical reasons why a, a nation's diversity has changed in, in terms of the food it produces. And there are now reasons which we can understand because of new science of why that diversity matters far beyond production of calories. And I think, yeah, millets is, is one example of, in India of that. Okay, thank you for your answer. Um, oh, oh, I don't want to monopolize. And there's also <laughs> a question up there, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is just a follow-up from what you mentioned earlier about the dormant seeds and kind of they need to be in the ground for it to be, you know, worth them mm. existing. Is there a concern that a lot of those seeds actually won't be able to survive in current current conditions given the climate crisis and so there's a lot more urgency of replanting and seeing what's viable and encouraging that adaptation that should have been happening over the last thousands of years? Mm. Um. I, that is the case that I think, and this is why I think a backup is also important because how well some of these hundreds of seed banks around the world are maintained is, is questionable. And the one that ended up in Syria, for example, had previously been in Iraq and they'd moved it from Iraq to <laughs> Syria thinking that that would be a safer place. So again, there are lots of um, uh, reasons why we need to be worried about that, that resource. Um, but actually, one of the reasons they exist is so that crop breeders can be experimenting with them, trialing them. And I think we just do not know enough about the different traits in these seed banks. Um, there are, there's a guy in uh, India called Debal Deb, who is going from village to village to find some of the last or the disappearing um, varieties of rice there. Some of them, um, he, he has found can grow in highly saline soils, others in um, flooded areas for, for long periods of time, and they can survive and be, still be viable. Some of them can absorb nanoparticles of silver, and they're used in indigenous communities for, as, as almost like medicine, uh, as a treatment. So again, the huge amounts of different, the, the diversity um, and the application of that, um, we're just scratching the surface. One example of that that I write about in the book is a story of some botanists who travelled to um, a village in Oaxaca in the late 1970s and, and come across a village where they were really surprised to see maize because the soil was so unfavourable. Um, but they arrive and they see this 16-foot-tall um, type of maize with bizarre aerial roots coming out from the ground, dripping a very weird alien-looking kind of mucus, glistening, and, and dripping, um, and they had no idea why this plant could survive there or what this mucus was doing. And it was only four years ago at UC Davis in the States, they had the analytical tool, the tools to actually unpick the mucus, and they realized it was full of thousands of different types of microbes that were being fed sugars by the plant, and in turn were fixing nitrogen from the air 
to fertilize the plant. So we have, we're, again, there is so much we do not know um, that indigenous societies instinctively knew or saved and replanted because they depended on them. Uh, and because of the Green Revolution and the success of that calorie production, the investment just hasn't happened in the research to unravel what's out there. So I th and in a sense, I think that could also be a positive thing, that there is a resource that's been created over thousands of years that we can now tap into because climate change and these unpredictable c circumstances that we now face will depend on diversity to give us greater resilience. At the moment, the system is extremely fragile because it's so uniform. Yeah, another question. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad you talked about the banana because I heard it on a BBC food program ah. and <laughs> ever since that point, every time I eat a banana, I always feel this sadness that I haven't tried the others. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and I'm a food designer and a lot of what people, I, I work with people to, to talk about these things, but a lot of what people ask me is what can I do? And I guess th this is not really about the seed bank. This is more about the extinction and also uh, trying new things. And it's something that I feel with this banana. So. My question is really, what can cons consumers actually do to, to, to change this? To, uh, uh, you know, can they start to find producers that are doing this stuff? Or, or is there different ways that you, you have ideas on? Yeah, good, good question. Possibly the most important question. I mean, mm -hmm. do you, I mean, before I give my answer and I can find some images, I'll check. Do, what's your thoughts on that? We've, we've thought a lot about this and we've spoken with a lot of people and of course there are many things that need to happen at the same time so as consumers of course we we can only play our role and then governments and industry will have to play their roles too um, there is a question about scalability of this solution that i'm about to to mention but um, there's a lot of people now talking more about direct trades or like shortening supply chains not necessarily geographically but in terms of how close you have a relationship with producers and you can reward those producers who maybe will plant a variety of seeds that are seasonal and you know you'll receive i don't know boxes at home with mm. whatever you don't even know you you're going to find out what is there and learn how to cook with these new ingredients that maybe you've never even encountered um this happened there was a spike with this during the the pandemic. But then again, the big question around this is um, how scalable this solution is. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. As a consumer, I would, I would personally, I try to, I can only give a personal opinion, I think, uh, in this situation, but I, um, I tend to, um, to reward these sort of uh, practices more than just always buying the same <coughs> products and out of season all year round. Yeah, um, and no, and I think that's becoming increasingly possible because of technology. So, yeah. I, um, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to travel to the set so-called centres of origin of where are where the world's most important crops originated, and I, I travelled to um, uh, southern China uh, and the origins of rice. And I, and again, they had their parallel green revolution. They were still quite. And they were closed off at that point in terms of science. So they had a parallel process of creating hybrid types of rice um, because of the, again, more recent famines they had in China. And I met, I met one of the farmers who'd saved some of the traditional um, types of rice. It was a red, so-called red-tipped glutinous or sticky rice that he used for all kinds of different dishes and also <laughs> made, made wine using it. And... Um, and we were in the middle of nowhere, and I'm thinking, this guy in his 70s, um, how on earth is he surviving and making any money from saving this rice? Everyone else was growing the, the modern types of rice and having problems with um, you know, being overwhelmed by, by weeds and, and other kinds of diseases, um, plant diseases. And he got, out, he got out his phone and he showed me WeChat, this mm -hmm. app. <laughs> and he was selling his rice yeah. all over China <laughs> to these consumers. And I think, you know, we, we can... It, you know, I mean, that people are building alternative yeah. uh, food systems, and uh, this this guy who's in southern Germany, um, in the early 2000s, was mourning the loss of something that went extinct in his community. So, um, 
I mentioned in the Neolithic package that left the Fertile Crescent thousands of years ago, slowly moves into Europe, and one of the most important and most humble of those ingredients was uh, lentils. And in this rocky part of southern Germany, uh, the lentil was one of the most important food sources, but also it was, it was essential for crop rotation because it did um, fertilise the soil, so they could grow other types of, uh, of um, grains as well. But in the 1960s, Canada took a decision to become the biggest supp global supplier of lentils. Germany was industrialising, lots of people were leaving the land, going to the cities. Why would you need to grow lentils? This guy, a few decades later, after the extinction of a, of, of a type of lentil that was adapted to the, the Alps, the Swabian Alps, um, contacted every seed bank he could um, uh, make contact with. No luck. No, it seemed like nobody had travelled through in the 1920s or 30s to save the seed and s keep it safe somewhere. Um, but with a, with a group of um, farmers from this remote part of, of Swabia, travels to Russia to go to Vavilov's seed um, bank uh, in St. Petersburg, and luckily, even though they didn't think they had it, they had it, but it had been filed under the wrong name. And this is one of my favourite photos in my research, is the fact him being reunited with his seed. <laughs> and it's a powerful photo because he is, he, he's found or rediscovered um, not just a way of farming, a farming system, but a way of life for him. And um, he, he returns to Germany and be partly because it tastes so delicious and there's a market for it. A couple of hundred farmers join him in, in growing this food. And then um, his story inspires a group of farmers in Sweden to go back through different historical records about what people were eating. And again, these humble soups and stews, affordable, nutritious, uh, again, fertilizes the soil. And then all of a sudden, there's this movement across Europe of these small-scale producers going back through the history books, including three guys in England who create a, a company called Hodmedods, and they realise that the fava bean was being grown in Bronze Age Britain. And so they've returned that, and again, you know, great, great packaging, marketing, all those other things. But these are really simple, humble foods with a story as well, and I think that's so important. Um, and the, this alternative food system is growing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we were talking a lot about like crops and also on land farming, but like the food system is also like consisting of the ocean. So I was wondering what you think like within the aquatic food system. Um, like which areas issues need or deserve more attention or maybe also you came across some uh, like um, approaches yet mm. that you found like promising so like just some insights on that maybe. Yeah, yeah. Let me just whiz back through again. Sorry about this, but uh, just <laughs> I want to get to um, uh, there. So the, Gre the Green Revolution was the 20th century version of, of trying to create uniformity and, and productivity. With, with livestock, it happened centuries before. So in the 18th century, there was a, an English farmer who attempted to take out the random uh, process of breeding on farms and actually start to design, redesign uh, farm animals and was hugely successful. So he became one of the wealthiest farmers in Europe because he was coming up with sheep that produced more wool, um, cattle that could grow faster and more muscle for meat, so on and so on. And, um, and into the 20th century, we then end up with you know, the chicken of tomorrow in the US, where you know, lots of the small um, birds then suddenly became big because there was a, it was con four times faster a concerted like that, effort yeah. <laughs> by supermarkets and by you know, political institutions and the, with help of the government to literally redesign the bird in, in, within a decade. Uh, to the point where it, it has all the problems we associate with fast-growing poultry where it can't really stand on its legs. Um, with, with, with fishing, um, again, huge amounts of industrial technology comes on stream at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th. So the amount of fish that could be caught by one boat then, we've never, we could never replicate now because that abundance has been 
decimated by this almost military exercise we've waged uh, with using sonar and the arrival of nylon in the 1930s, for example, completely changed the way we fish. Is the, I mean, the question I, one of the questions I look at in the, in the book, as well as the loss of huge amounts of biodiversity because of pollution and overfishing, etc., is can aquaculture be part of the solution? And a lot of people in the 1960s and 70s go into fish farming thinking this is conservation. I'm, I'm, I want to take the pressure off the wild species. And as with um, Bakewell in the 18th century, Norwegian breed uh, fish um, scientists took a number of different uh, salmon from around seven different rivers and then they create, they, it's a modern day domestication story. So they create the farmed fish which will a, be, uh, which can tolerate swimming around in small pens and being fed, um, you know, uh, un, you know, processed, effectively processed food as well. But in parallel with that, we see the disappearance, the near disappearance from many of Europe's river systems of the wild Atlantic salmon. And we're starting to understand what the impact or the inter interconnect or the connection is between the rise of the farm salmon and the decline of the, um, sorry, the rise of the farm salmon and the decline of the wild because of, for example, escapees from the farm system, weakening the gene pool of the wild and also the, the impact of lice build up in the pens and so you know therefore it's still it's still a really important question that more than 50 percent of the world's fish consumption now is dependent on aquaculture which depends on huge amounts of protein from the sea to feed that system um yeah and uh, actually if i can add yeah. something on this. so i recently did some research into um the state of the mediterranean sea and apparently the Mediterranean is one of the, the most depleted seas uh, around the world. And now 70%, I think 75% uh, of the fish stocks are actually either maximally exploited mm. or overexploited, which means that we risk actually losing these species over the next uh, few years. And I was speaking with some researchers who were saying, you know, we actually... The, the, the proportion is not linear. We don't need to necessarily stop fishing altogether, but if we already reduced by 20% the amount of industrial fishing we do in these oceans, we would give time to the populations to, to repopulate and, and have even more. Yeah. And, but, but also, going back to diversity and lack of diversity, we're very much used to always eating the same species, and we expect to find always the same sorts of fish in, in a supermarket, for example. But um, some fishermen and researchers were telling me, you know, if we just as consumers were fine with, you know, oh, this week or this month, there's this other type of fish, which we don't know, but actually is going to impact our oceans much less because there's a huge population of these fish right now. And then, you know, we, we let the other ones uh, do, do well and repopulate in the meantime. So definitely, yeah. Because yeah. as the film demonstrated so well, I mean, this idea of abundance and... Yeah consistency and uniformity which again nature doesn't produce that um yeah. but yeah so i think marine conservation areas protected yeah. areas are really essential yeah. and also eating lower down the, the food, food chain ch food chain yeah, yeah and smaller fish and you know like sardine as opposed to big meaty cod yeah. uh, and also there are forms of um aquaculture so mol mollusks um, so bivalves yeah. uh mussels for example uh, f they filter the water and also highly nutritious, um, very low impact. Yeah. About this um, topic that you just talked about, I was thinking, isn't it like part of the solution to like giving up our privilege about food? Like all this abundance that we have, you know? And why do we even eat bananas? <laughs> you know, like I wonder if in other parts of the world, like in Vietnam, for example, they're obsessed with blueberries, you know, mm. and they do everything for having them at the lowest price from the other part of the world, you know, and it's, you know, with like our avocado obsession, for example, you know, mm. that we have yeah. right now. I'm just making yeah. some example. I, I don't know, like if we don't have something, should we try to obtain it at any cost? 
Yeah, that's a big question of the mm. of the of the episode, and we didn't want to give necessarily the answer to this because it always feels a little strange to tell people you should just have less. Uh, no one wants to hear that, and uh, we, we're now used to having so much more. But but I personally, I think consumer awareness about these issues will already change us a little bit. Uh, Hopefully, after this conversation already, we will look at bananas differently or, or blueberries differently. Mm. But um, there's a big question right now. Uh, and it's often framed as the, the sort of uh, wizards versus prophets mm. kind of a ch uh, challenge. Uh, not challenge, but um, different perspectives on, on the food system, the climate, any environmental climatic challenge. Uh, Charles Mann uh, framed... The, the argument saying that there's people who are wizards who say, you know, innovation, we will find technology and innovation and we will solve these issues and we will be able to give more to people, not tell people that they should restrict their diets. Um, and actually, we will have to increase our food production by 70% in less than 30 years. So we will, we will be able to do it with a new green revolution, with new new technology, new innovation. And then there's the prophets uh, who frame the argument from the other perspective. They say, well, actually, we're just doomed to eating to extinction and we're, we're just forcing uh, the boundaries of nature a little bit too much and the boundaries of what we can do and we're being a bit too arrogant with thinking that we will always find the solution because eventually every solution creates a new problem and the uh, new problems that we will create will be too big. So. The problem is that with both of these perspectives, we, we struggle to, to solve the issue and we probably need to find a sort of um, an in-between uh, point of view where we, we do think about maybe reducing a little bit what we're doing and, and change uh, our consumption, especially in countries like Europe where we have maybe too much abundance. Um, but then also at the same time, we find the new technologies to increase the amount of food that is made available to a growing population and to the 800 million people who mm. don't have even yeah. enough food. I don't uh, know what you would say Well, to uh, the, uh, the reason why I wanted to show this image, because um, yeah. <laughs> I spent some time in Tanzania with some of the last of the hunter-gatherers in, in Africa. And, and the argument here isn't, we need to go back and become hunter-gatherers again. And actually, the Hadza are thoroughly modern human beings who are opting, they're choosing to live the lifestyle of uh, hunter-gatherers while the, the outside world encroaches on that. So they're under huge amounts of pressure, but they're still determined to live I in that way. What's fascinating is throughout the seasons, they have access to 800 different plant and animal species, huge amounts of diversity. And you know, some days they'll you know, in gorge on their favourite food, uh, honey, um, which will be directed to them because of this conversation they've been having or their ancestors have been having with a bird, um, a honey guide bird, indicate, scientific name indicator, indicator. Um, we think the bird started to lead the hunters to the honey around 700,000, a million years ago, as soon as humans were able to control fire and smoke and safely get access to the honey that the uh, uh, the bird had led them to. The, the bird in exchange wants the wax and the, the larvae. Um, this is a disappearing conversation. But I think the most powerful thing f for me, and just in, in answer to your question, is yeah, I mean, this idea of n nobody, I mean, this idea that uh, supermarkets are giving what we ask for. Nobody's ever asked me what I want mm -hmm. from, a, from a supermarket. <laughs> but um, I think this idea of the, you know, the same consistent uniform fruits and vegetables and um, all of the other um, foods that fill those supermarket chains. I think we just need to just remind ourselves about millions of years of human evolution based around diversity and what we've survived on and depended on. Um, and we need to break out of this cycle, of this um, expectation of abundance, yeah. which you touched on as well. And it's a fabricated, you know, it's an invented yeah. Yeah. abundance as well. But also importantly... A, a, a superficial diversity based on this, the uniform genetic inputs of those three major crops that can be ultra-processed into all kinds of different things. So I think the more we understand about the importance of diversity in human evo evolution, um, we were talking about the gut microbiome earlier today, fascinating and, and really important because 
as we, the more diverse our gut microbes are, the impact on our physical and mental health yeah. we now are realizing it's significant. And the more diversity we eat, the more diverse our, our gut microbiomes. I went to visit the has spent some time at the hazard with a uh, epidemiologist, Professor Tim Spector, who oh. is studying the gut microbiome and realized that the had to have. Um, gut microbes that have gone extinct in Western populations. What they do, we, we don't fully understand. But, you know, the Hadza, they die of many other things, like falling from trees and, you know, accidents and all these other things. But they don't die from food-related illnesses. So there's a really powerful, simple message about where we came from in terms of our relationship with the planet, with nature, with diversity, and how that has been completely overridden <coughs> in the blink of an eye, as you're saying, a tiny, tiny moment in human history. Yeah. And also, about, on top of abundance, it's perfection. I mean, I, I was, ju just to answer also the question from earlier, the other day I was in a supermarket and they gave, um, they gave me for free, they wanted to give me for free a few apples that were slightly bruised. Mm -hmm. And we just throw away so much that I think it's, it's the avocado and the bananas, but even just the daily foods that we eat and that are from around us, we end up, you know, uh, impacting so much on, on the climate and the resource that we, resources mm. we use just because we're so spoiled. Yeah. Um, I saw uh, that many of okay. them. So yeah. yeah. And can I just answer that question that you touched on earlier, that are these new scientific breakthroughs going to be the solution to everything? Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of who controls protein production and distribution globally, I mean, there are, you know, it's the Tysons and the the ADMs and the Cargills and, you know, Conagra and JBS in, you know, in, in, in South America. If you look at who's actually investing in the new protein technologies, so the, you know, the alternative, you know, the meat substitutes, for example, you also find, you know, Cargill, one of the biggest investors in some of the new alternative proteins, as a defense mechanism, really, that if the existing uh, model of conventional intensive livestock production is under pressure, they are one of the key investors and beneficiaries of the new technologies. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your uh, uh, documentary and also for, um, for the presentation so far. Um, I have this question because um, if you have all different kinds of uh, foods, um, people are, tend to be a little bit afraid of tasting new things, like what they've learned to eat, they, they uh, tend to eat, and what they've not learned to eat, uh, it's very, they can be anxious about eating that. So, um, perhaps we have to learn to eat again, but then uh, pretty much different kind of flavors. But how can we uh, learn people uh, to accept all those different flavors because that's very scary for a lot of people. Yeah, I think there's definitely, I would say, different tiers of this. One thing I think is to convince people to eat insects, which are very far removed, I guess, from what we eat. But I don't know, recently I've, again, I've found black, black chickpeas. They're not so far away from a <laughs> from a chickpea, but, but they're, they're a different variety. They're a different species of, of a thing that I'm used to eating. So I wonder how much of that will actually be very hard. Uh, I, I don't know what you think, Dan. Um, but, I, but I get your point, and I think we should definitely, I don't know, yeah. educate. Education to, to eat again, you yeah. know, develop a different relationship with food is necessary. Um, yeah, and I think in the UK, um, I've been really impressed by visiting schools where they're practicing something called Taste Ed. It's called Taste Education, where getting beyond what um, food lessons have become in schools, which is you know uh, five a day, uh, traffic mm -hmm. light systems, um, you know good calories, bad calories, that kind of thing. Which you know for kids is a it's boring and b yeah. uh, that's scary. I think just to be told how you know, that. Um, that taste it actually, um, you bring the food into, you, you bring fruits and vegetables into the classroom and then kids can actually see, touch, smell. They use all senses to explore the food which they might not get to see um, at home or yeah. anywhere, uh, you know, in the school food system, in the, in the canteen, for example. And, they, they, you know, it's been running for a few years in, in different parts of... Um, Scandinavia, and, and it's relatively new in the UK, but it's already 
shifting um, thinking, um, certainly with the parents whose kids are coming home and saying, can we try this or can we eat this or can we cook with that? So, But yeah, it's a complete re-education because of how powerful this shift has been. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as a species, you know, the fact that we use this science and technology to create this, in some ways, amazing system, yeah. um, but it, it meant that we've got, we have this disconnect, and it's a dangerous thing because, you know, we all die without good nutrition, without without food. So, yeah. Um, yeah so I think taste education, and also I think just the storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, the the reason why I came to write the book was because I fell in love with this project created by Slow Food in the 1990s. Because they were, they realised all of these traditions and flavours and systems were disappearing, and so they created an online catalogue which you can all look at. Uh, and there's drop-down menus, so wherever you are in the world, you can see what's disappearing or endangered where you live. But yeah, more than 5,000 foods from 150 odd countries, each one with an amazing story of how it, it shaped cultures and identities and allowed people to to survive and and thrive in different parts of the world. So, again, I think people should, yeah, taste education, f listen to the stories, fall in love with the stories, then try the food, and then maybe that will, you know, yeah. reduce some of your your anxiety. But we shouldn't. We shouldn't. I think you know we shouldn't be um, afraid of food unless obviously there's a real health issues <laughs> but yeah. I think no but again because I, I, if you think again it's about human evolution and what we how we got here today um, it isn't because of the last hundred years you've got to think about the last two million years we are so adaptable that's, that's the, the crucial thing yeah. and our palates are so changeable and adaptable and we can be re-educated and reacquainted sourness and bitterness so bitterness in foods is an indicator of chemical compounds that are beneficial to us because they are part of the plant's defense mechanism. With, in the 20th century, with the new fruit breeding techniques, what do we do? We remove the bitterness, we made the fruit bigger and sweeter, and to compensate for the lack of defense mechanism in the fruit, we spray them with chemicals. <laughs> and bitterness is good for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, and uh, we're, we're very adaptable, I think. So yeah, over yeah. the course of one generation, many things can change. Exactly, we, so we, we should be proven. optimistic. Yeah. 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 There's I hope you question. don't get mad after my comment. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you don't understand it both. Um, did you try to sell each of you a product where you dream about? Sorry, Did you try to sell a product where you dream of and write about? Uh -huh. Sorry, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> is it? Yeah. The question Maybe is... Maybe ask it in a different way. I think way. You, you, you write wonderful books mm. and very good uh, documentaries, but you have to sell, to sell the product. Did you try to sell a product where you dream about and where you write about? Uh, I didn't dream, I mean, I, I've spoken to some of the most, you know, the, the leading scientists and experts in their fields around the world to try and distill what we are learning about food and farming systems and put it into a book. It's not a dream. No. Also, I think uh, that our credibility is what makes us sell. My, so my I think, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is, but, but the... Uh, my topic is, is all correct what you read and you tell us, but how do you sell this new product, the product with, with more bi biodiversity, etc., etc.? I'm in the, I'm a farmer. Uh -huh. I'm already 40, year in, 40 years in the pig business, and we developed a, a concept with more di biodiversity. If you look at the Dutch market, three persons decide what 12 million people eat right. every day. Yeah. Yeah. Albert Heijn. Jumbo and Superini, and that it accounts for every category. Three people decide what we eat. We try to sell a new concept, and the door is closed. We are struggling 20 years. So, I think that it's all okay what you write, what you write. Mm -hmm. but we have 
to put less more, a lot more energy in how do we sell the, the business. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. And I also believe that farmers have been some of the biggest victims in, this, in the creation of this system. And with three, four, five million euros, uh, animal welfare opposite, opposite groups are uh, able to, to, to tell their story. And we yeah. are mm. in common not able to tell our story. So how are we going to tell our story and that we find customers for the right product? And we, every farmer is willing to produce that product, but he is in a system that he yeah. can't move forward, backwards. Yes, absolutely. So uh, this is a call for today, how are we going to change the system? And uh, we need a, a, a movement with uh, telling the story and decides to buy those products. Yeah, yeah. I, I think... Um Definitely. I mean, sorry for not understanding the question initially, but um, we've been talking a lot about what can, con what can consumers do. I think uh, I was reading that over the past few decades, we've actually become much more consumers and much less citizens. Uh, and we, don't, we, we think that with our individual choices, we can change the system. And of course, we can, uh, part partially. But then also, we need, to, we need to push our governments to make the right decisions, to create the right playing field for farmers, for industry to go into the right direction. And I think a lot of more political work needs to be done also from the bottom up to, to change mm. this system, um, unfortunately. I, I think don't believe in, in political systems who are changing the food game. Mm. You're not, I, you don't. I think the consumer has to decide. Yeah, so I think th this, I mean, the reason why the slow food um, story is interesting is, um, is because they has, have this concept of the co-producer, so pe consumers who aren't passive, but actually engaged and, uh, and I also mentioned you know, the fact that technology can actually bring us closer to you as a, as a farmer and a, and a food producer. But admittedly, I think you know, consumer behaviour needs to change. The more of us who know this story and the fact that this is a, a problem, the better I think but also we do need subsidies to change. Yeah. Uh, you are going to be locked into a system unless there is a concerted, concerted effort um, for um, allocation of subsidies to, um, to, to follow greater diversity in systems. And also the fact that COP is coming up. I mean, food was neglected in the previous COP. Um, but a lot of people have, have woken up to the fact, you know, because of what's, what we're seeing in Ukraine, the weaponization of food. Uh, we talked about uh, how dependent we are in terms of energy at the beginning of the crisis, and we ended up talking about the need for, to, div to diversify food systems as well. So the fact that this is such a high priority issue right now, I think it, it's, an, it's an opportunity for politicians to engage uh, and, and, and change the system um, significantly. But it's not going to happen overnight. It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a, a while for that to happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think we all, as consumers, have a responsibility to, to understand how this system works and the fact that the farmers are being squeezed in the in the middle, really, between yeah, you know, particularly by the retailers. But also, there are companies such as you know Unilever, who are investing huge amounts of money in looking at diversifying their supply chains, um, and that will hopefully trigger you know that will. Um, impact on their relationship with, with the production side of things as well. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I can understand why you'd feel frustrated and angry and locked into the system. That's what I'm trying, that's the story I'm trying to tell. I think there were some questions up there and then one down here. Um, yes, my question is a little bit about the um, previous question. Um, I think if you look at the title of this uh, event, it's about uh, redesigning the broken uh, food system, um, but I think the system itself is a, also what you said is incredibly efficient. You get exactly what you want. If you want something else in this system, you set up your own company, you make it, you try to sell it, and exactly what the previous speaker will tell, it will 90% of all the business will be out of business within one or two years. It doesn't work because this market is too efficient. 
and people want that, most of them. So we are in a capitalist system and this is what you get. So the solution, as an economist, I study economy mm -hmm. as well, um, and things should be with the government. And the government actually is the people. We get the government we, want, we choose. Mm -hmm. And as long as the government doesn't have a long-term vision of how we have to live together in the whole world, not in Holland, no, in the whole world, with nature. If we don't have a vision about that, and we don't have long-term plans, nothing will change. And all these damages, like you said, there's nine, the, the economy is nine trillion, but the, the damage is 12, tri 12, 12 trillion, so three yeah. billion damages each year. So if we don't price in these damages into the current system, nothing will change. But that's exactly so, why I think change is going to happen. Yeah, so the government has to price it in. They, they, yeah. can, they can set the rules, they can set the government system. Yeah, and we're price it in. public health budgets are increasing all the time in terms of diabetes, yes. uh, diabetes ob obesity. We are not stuck in this situation so forever it, because it's just un it, it will not be able to continue yeah, as it the, is. But the people have to change first. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Well, I think. I think. People is the government. I think a lot. We we tend to say something needs to happen first, so that something else can happen later. But I actually think many things need to happen at the same time, and and they are. I think there's more consumer awareness. We are talking about these things, and there's, thankfully, interest in in an event like this. And um, there, you know, governments need to change at the same time. But we need. There's no consumer and then government, or government and then consumer. There's two. The paths going in parallel at the same time. I, I, that, that's at least the way I see it. Well, if you think also about the trillions of dollars that it float around the world and uh, from investors as well, um, they are increasingly engaged in th investing outside of the existing model because they see risk in the system. They see the risk of, uh, of government regulations because of the consequence of public health. They see the risk of uh, disease outbreaks in livestock populations, they see the risk of crop failures because of the genetic uniformity as well. Follow the money. I mean, the money is going into interesting places in different parts of the world. Not necessarily just that, but you know, in terms of yeah, building an alternative food system because they are factoring risk into the existing system. There was a question here, and then, and then there. Uh, thanks. Um, I was uh, thinking, we said like 80% of the people buy their food in supermarkets and they, the supermarkets uh, are not really changing really fast, I think, and I don't know if they can change fast enough to uh, help uh, this uh, system. So isn't it then maybe a solution that we make new food chains, so we buy our food somewhere else, now it's more efficient to go to the supermarket because you can buy there everything so a lot of people go there because it um, doesn't take a lot of time but with all these technology we have there must be solutions to make corporations of farmers and people with good products to mm. make platforms i don't know how but yeah sometimes i think is it uh, should we wait for the supermarkets or should we just i don't know <laughs> yeah make a new system and a new chain and will also maybe trigger the supermarkets. Yeah. That was my question, how you think about yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think a, a big shift is already happening and has been exacerbated by the pandemic. I think mm. numbers are changing. So many more people now go on online supermarkets than they used to, and there, there's been a shift towards online technologies rather than going in person at the supermarket. Of course, many, many people still go, but there is a trend. Um, that has started and has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so I think that as we move online, there are many tools that can be used to interact way differently with the people who, who, who produce or uh, bring our food to us. Um, one example, I mean, I can give just a couple of examples from the UK. I lived in the UK and um, I used to use Riverford uh, Foods. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a cooperative of, of organic farmers all over the UK. And then they also have some ties with some organic farmers in Europe. Um, and they send weekly boxes. You can't choose, you have, you don't have these enormous 
choice uh, as in a supermarket, but they sell, you know, old, seasonal fruits and vegetables plus other essentials. Um, and I found that that was really good. It, it really changed my relationship with food because in a way I was just receiving something um, that I had to think about um, putting together. So usually I, I went the other way around. I would go to the supermarket, have a recipe, get a lot of ingredients that then and maybe I wouldn't even use anymore. And I had a lot more waste at home, but I've changed a lot my relationship with food by just receiving these boxes directly from farmers, or at least, you know, the intermediaries are, are much fewer. Um, I don't know if this is something that is scalable. I don't know if this is something that, you know, is the right direction to go into, but there's definitely more and more of these initiatives that are popping up. Well, a couple of generations ago, we might be thinking that, you know, the small grocery store or origins markets. of Tesco, was that scalable? You know, we might be, you know, asking and obviously who knows yeah. what the the yeah. new models are with the application of new technology in the uk uh, as, as you mentioned there are box schemes there are uh, day boats coming up coming out with catch that are being used as almost um, uh, that's the kind of fish equivalent so huge amounts of innovation new ideas um, i mean my in my epilogue in the book i mean i, I argue these systems will coexist we but we need more diversity and we can't afford for all of these uh, resources uh, uh, to um, just go extinct. They will coexist with a commodity system. If you are in the commodity system, then you are going to be obviously exposed to the market, global market forces for that. But I think this, with the application of new technology, with the new science of, of what means a healthy diet and good nutrition, that means that will be a huge market and business opportunity for greater diversity in the food system. Uh, there was a question here. Yeah. There was a question here for a while. I I'll, think. I'll pass the mic oh, on to you. Yeah. <laughs> and then, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you both for the time. Um, I wanted to go back to the to the seed bank for for one bit. Mm -hmm. As I find it quite interesting that there's such a huge diversity store there, whether it's in Norway or whether it's in different seed banks. But at the same time, it's this quite sterile environment. It's very hard, I think, for as a human being to relate to a place where they try to st stop the freeze time, literally. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you think we as consumers can relate more or increasingly to these seed banks? Is there such a big diversity there? And I think in history-wise, this diversity was not in the seed bank in ice, but it was on our... Yeah, on but there are, the again, this is only a backup. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the UK, there is what we call the Heritage Seed Library, which was set up in the 1970s, which was, again, that period post... Well, when the Green Revolution is kicking in, supermarkets are coming on stream. There, is, uh, there are new regulations across Europe about um, seeds uh, and being able to sell seeds. And as a response, uh, a journalist um, wrote a letter in a newspaper and said, we're losing huge amounts of um, diversity in our vegetables and fruits and set up um, a means of seed exchange. The Heritage Seed Library is based in Coventry and they, they, uh, you can withdraw, you know, you can um, ask for the seeds and then you can grow them in your allotment or in your garden or whatever. And that's a, very, that's a community of thousands and thousands of people in the UK who were sharing seeds. And there are lots of seed swapping events that take place as well. And the main reason they do this is partly, well, it's, it's flavor. They are tasting things in some of these older varieties um, that is it, it, it's substantially different to what you get in a, in a, in a supermarket. So I, th I think that, I mean, the vault is important as a backup resource, and it's called the doomsday vault, vault for a reason. You know, because if things do go badly wrong around the world in terms of the viability of the seeds that are being stored in those seed banks, future crop breeders, even the ones who are breeding um, crops for um, commodity, uh, they, need, they need those genetic resources. But at the same time, I bet somewhere not that far from where you live, there will be a community of, of seed savers. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, just, I'll just give you one example of the application of, of, the, of the seed vault that actually will impact directly on us in, in maybe in the next decade or so. In Cambridge, there is NIAB. It's, called, it's the National Institute of Agricultural um, Botany. It was set up after the First World War uh, to try and give farmers the best performing crops possible. 
and the scientists who are now working there today are taking um, uh, seeds of goat grasses from seed banks in Svalbard and also some in the States and also um, in, uh, in Turkey as well. Goat grasses were the, one of the ancestors of uh, wheat. So in the Fertile Crescent 100,000 years ago, there was by chance a completely random chance event of a goat grass crossing with a wild an uh, ancestor of wheat, giving us the evolutionary process and the selection of humans that give us the bread wheat today. What these scientists are now doing in the 21st century is going back through the goat grasses that didn't get involved in that, that, that event 100,000 years ago and breeding them back in to see what kind of diversity we could have in future, in future wheat. I mean, it's mind-blowing. They are going back 100,000 years in time in wheat history, but they are using the seed banks to do that because of concerns over drought, pests, climate change, you know, lack of water, all of these things, to see if there are the genetic traits that, w that were lost in that process that we embarked on. Yeah. So, yeah, I think endlessly fascinating, the whole seed, seed banks, but also the application of them today. Yeah. Have time for one more question? Yes. Uh, the, the girl with the yeah. green sweater. Hi. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, sorry for keep jumping around as well, um, but I wanted to go back to kind of what you were saying about the fact that so many things need to happen at once to kind of have effective transformation because, I mean, it's something that we haven't really spoken about here, but, um, you know, vast, like food deserts and the fact that good food costs more money, like bad food is cheap. And I know we're talking about the fact that the consumer has like all this power, but a lot of consumers don't have a lot of power, which is why I kind of agree with uh, someone who said it over there. You know, governments do need to do something because a lot of these food companies are getting away with, I mean, I, I remember writing a story back in the in the summer holidays um, in the UK about the fact that all this food that was on um, our like free the equivalent of free school meals during the summer holidays was terrible for children, um, but it, they were poor, so that's the food you're going to get. Um, yeah. So I do just think that yeah, we can There's needs to be a bit of nuance there, perhaps, about the fact that not all consumers have this power to make these decisions, and that something like a vegetable box is kind of a luxury for a yeah. lot of people, especially now. Yeah, it's apparent. It's a. It's a. It's a we 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 think we. It seems that we have all of this power because there is all of this abundance, but actually, of all of that abundance, there's a there, there's a minority of that abundance that is good food for us, actually, and. Um, Absolutely. Actually, sixth episode of the docu series will be all about food deserts and uh, and all the things you talked about. So, <laughs> but can we not confuse this is a food problem with that's an economic problem as well? Right. People not being paid enough. Um. People in poor housing. All these other costs. That, that, that you know that, that there's a food problem definitely, but also there are wider economic problems that are about social justice. And I, actually, I think the more research I do into the food sy system, the more I realize that this food system is a part of a much bigger system. And so the problems of the food system are not just inherent mm. to the food system. It's, a, it's almost like a symptom of other problems that are going on around. And again, about um, you know, it's the same idea that we, more, more things need to happen at the same time. But some of them will have to do directly with the food system and some of them will have to do with our socio-economic mm. systems and, and political systems as well. But, yeah, mm. hopefully we'll change it. <laughs> we'll stay, stay optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay optimistic. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, thank you all for your... Um, time so far and for all the questions uh, I really like that it was really an actual conversation because mm. yeah. yeah you never know but uh, we are in, uh, in in the Netherlands and uh, you show that you that you are indeed good talkers and uh, have opinions so that's good <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, uh, continue the conversation in the foyer uh, you have all uh, drink tokens um, there will be uh, magazines and uh, not books but, <laughs> but we file <laughs> But we will, we will definitely sell them. Um, and um, yeah, um, um, talking for Food Unfolded, please uh, 
follow us, reach out to us for a collaboration, uh, reach out to us uh, with your stories uh, uh, so that we can cover them and uh, that we can together change this food system. I think, yeah, we tried in a, in a, in a cinema room, but yeah, we need to, uh, to con continue this discussion and to take actions. Um, anything to add from your sides? No, thank, thanks no, well, so much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank, thanks for coming along, along and listening and asking some brilliant questions as well. I mean, again, it's only scratching the surface here, but I think it, it is about knowing the story is the starting point, really, because there's no way in which we can change anything if we're not informed. Uh, you know, whether you agree or disagree, it's, you know, I think we need to know this history of, of how we got here uh, and the consequences if we don't engage. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you.